is Jed Emerson, and I'm with uh, Impact Assets and Splendid Value and various other things. Uh, this is a session on the purpose of capital, and so I'm going to kind of tee that up, and then we're going to introduce our panelists for this discussion. About uh, two years ago, I kind of, I've been involved in impact investing for a long time, and about two years ago, I felt like all the conversations I was having were all about strategy and tactics and execution. And they're all about how do you do this? And I think that part of the reason that people are challenged by some of those questions is that uh, they focus on the how before they've really explored uh, the idea and the concept of why. And so they kind of assume that the, the why is a given and they um, kind of you know, kind of fall through this other issue of execution uh, that becomes more challenging because they haven't really clarified uh, the fundamental purpose of the capital that they have. They haven't really um, gone back to reconnect with issues of the fundamental purpose of their own life and what they're trying to really achieve through their deployment of capital. And so I, I, I just for myself decided I wanted to step back and really try to think through more and, and kind of question the assumptions that I had coming into this and understand more about what we collectively actually know about meaning and purpose. And I feel like we've devolved to uh, what's fundamentally a financial conversation about things that actually have to do with how we as a society and we as humanity over the centuries have really come to understand uh, and meaning and purpose. And it's really only been in the last, you know, 300 years that we've kind of focused on uh, the idea that you can separate kind of, you know, financial investing from social and environmental considerations of value. And I think that that, that split and that dualistic approach uh, makes it harder for us to really invest uh, with meaning and purpose. And so on my own uh, side, I basically spent about two years just catching up and reading. I've, I've read maybe 170 plus books to try to put myself uh, in a place where I could be reconnected to this broader conversation that I think really kind of spans the centuries. And so today, uh, what we wanted to do was, number one, just kind of acknowledge that this is actually a pretty complicated conversation to have. <laughs> so let me just call that out right up front. And we're just gonna get at one piece of it. Um, now, having kind of focused on this theme for a while, uh, there's part of me that feels like I could stand up and just lecture, um, and that would be uh, not exactly in the spirit of SOCAP. So what, instead, what I've done has been to uh, ask uh, some colleagues of mine who I think are approaching this work of impact investing from kind of a deeper place and are looking to kind of pull historic tradition into this conversation in a different way uh, to participate in this discussion. And so what we're going to do is start with a, a conversation amongst the four of us, and then we're going to have a, a pause to engage with you in any conversation and discussion you'd like to have. And then what we'd actually like to do would be to have um, each of you take some time and simply turn to the person next to you and have that a similar kind of discussion and have a chance for you to really connect with somebody else around part of that uh, conversation. Uh, so that's what we have in mind. And with that, I'm going to just kind of ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and say enough about the work that they're doing so you understand something of their context. And then we're really gonna kind of pivot away from what they do to try to get into a conversation around why they do it and how they have been informed by different traditions, uh, different history, different ways of thinking about purpose relative to then what they do in the world. Uh, so I'm going to start at the far end with Morgan, and do you want to just begin our process? Sure. Um, my name is Morgan Simon. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I've been in the social investment field for about 17 years at this point. I've worked with about $150 billion in that time. Um, the last two, five years has been investing on behalf of, of two clients doing 100% for impact approaches. So we've invested in over 50 companies and funds in that time. Um, and then I'm also a co-founder of a nonprofit called Transform Finance that's building a bridge between finance and social justice. Um, we launched 
a network of investors at the White House when it was a more hospitable place um, <laughs> that is now about two billion <coughs> strong, uh, investors who are specifically focused on social justice. And then we also do trainings for community leaders who are trying to understand this trend of impact investment, want to hold it accountable, um, but don't have much access. And those trainings have been 80% people of color um, over the last three years, and then also have done a couple internationally. Um, so I think I bring the perspective of, of a practitioner of, of actively allocating capital, but also thinking a lot about how do we organize people and capital in the field for maximum impact. Um, I'm really appreciative to be here today for the opportunity to talk in a way that's a lot more personal um, in terms of purpose. And from that perspective, if we wanted to pretend that this room was half as big and have folks in the back come forward, um, and if you still need to sneak out at some point, you're totally welcome to, um, but we'd love to see your faces for this conversation. So feel free to move up if that's something you're open to. Thanks so much. Omar? Uh, <coughs> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Omar Moho. Um, I want to thank Jed uh, for inviting me and all of you uh, for enabling and supporting uh, what I think will be a very important and uh, interesting conversation. Uh, for most of uh, the last 20 years, uh, I've advised capital providers and capital recipients uh, in transactions where principles of one form or another uh, impact uh, or control or temper uh, the profit uh, motive that, uh, that we seem to have as humans. Um, a large subset of what I do uh, is called uh, Sharia-based capital markets. Uh, or Islamic finance and investment, uh, which, uh, depending on where you may gather your information from, uh, may seem very foreign uh, and very unusual, uh, but the uh, principles, I think, uh, the Islamic values, the morals, the ethics, uh, they're very much in line with uh, the values that impact investors uh, generally are concerned about and that they're focused on. Um, <coughs> For, for those of you that are familiar with impact terms, uh, or rather impact deals, uh, and in fact the impact terms project, um, this boils down to helping uh, clients, be they capital providers or companies and businesses design uh, equity or capital structures and governance frameworks that are more participatory, uh, creating transactions in which there's greater risk sharing rather than uh, risk shifting, um, and for those transactions that are more, um, more debt-like than, say, pure uh, sort of capital that's purely at risk, um, it's about tying the, the return uh, to the financier uh, on the performance and the, uh, the, uh, the health of the asset uh, or the business. So, uh, you know, what, what I think most of what I do is strategy and structure. Uh, that's what it kind of boils down to. Uh, we have to be very creative because we are building bridges and joining uh, markets and different communities uh, together that may not uh, have previously spoken you know, in a deep fashion or, in, or really listened to one another. Um, let's see what else. I also teach uh, a few courses uh, at graduate schools in the U.S., uh, including Islamic finance, halal food law, and what I think is a really unique course, uh, bringing together Islamic spirituality, community sustainability, and business and finance. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific, and I will just ooh, hear the echo in my head as I echo um, all of the thanks to you for being here and to Jed for organizing the panel. Uh, my name is Allison Lingain, co-founder of Project Equity. We're a national nonprofit based across the Bay in Oakland. Um, and we f our mission is to increase economic uh, resiliency in low-income communities. And we fundamentally believe that in order to do that, we need to shift the control of capital and the control of livelihoods. And um, so our strategy is really to to scale employee ownership as, as a business model that, that does that. And we're tapping um, the silver tsunami, which is uh, the largest wealth transfer in our nation's history uh, as baby boomers retire. And we know that 10,000 baby boomers retire every day and that the, uh, the youngest of them will turn 65 in just shy of 15 years. And so we have this window of time um, in which uh, the baby boomers own one out of every two locally owned businesses um, across the country, uh, local employers. And so we know there's going to be a dramatic shift in the landscape of local business ownership. And the question is, do we want to shift it um, 
away from community control and, and local ownership, or do we want to concentrate it in that direction? And so we, of course, believe the latter. Um, and so for us, the, you know, the connection to the purpose and the meaning of capital is incredibly important because these are our businesses that think about it differently. Um, businesses where the decisions are made through the lens of what's good for the employees and by extension their families and their communities um, instead of businesses being made through the lens of what's good for the return on capital. Right, so, so the purpose and the meaning of capital is absolutely central, um, and for us it comes down to, the, to control and ownership, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. So why don't we just pick up on, on that point. I, impact investing and social enterprise, mission-driven companies, a lot of times speak about bringing your whole self to work. Um, as you think about the work that you're engaged in, are there wisdom traditions or historical kind of underpinnings that come in and then influence how you are in that context? Yeah, you know, um, Jed was kind enough to give us a clue to what he was going to ask before we got on the panel, right? Um, <laughs> Big issues. You've got to think about it. <laughs> but not in what order. <laughs> uh, so, you know, as I thought about that, I thought, well, you know, what, what really is my true self? And, um, you know, my family history is that my, my, uh, my a couple of generations ago, my family was uh, immigrant farmers in North Dakota. Um, and so the traditions of my family, you know, I thought I was going to come up with something big or profound, right? But it's just my family. <laughs> um, but it really is about um, uh, fairness, trust, community, helping each other. If you're going to survive the bl blizzards in North Dakota winter, you have to be able to depend on each other. Um, and so I've always seen business as a tool to, to do good in the world, right? To, to feed your family or to do, but rather than as something that's going to line my pockets or, you know, as a thing. And um, even though I've been involved in business for my whole adult life, um, I've always felt a little bit like I've looked at it from the outside as an outsider and I have a perspective. Um, um, so, so 20 years ago when I decided to go and get my MBA, I thought, gosh, am I going to find any of, you know, my people, my tribe? <laughs> Um, in business school, and you know, truth is, there's a lot of people who really see business as a tool to to create positive change in the world. Um, and you know, SoCap's kind of the same way. I've been coming for years, and and you know, even this year when I came, I thought, how long is it going to take me to find my tribe? You know, people who see capital as a tool to create positive change in the world um, versus as a as something to make money off of and feel good about it at the same time. It's just a very different perspective. Um, and so that, that for me is the grounding, is that this is, it, it's about it, it being a tool, the greater good, and, and coming back to those values, and how do we align what we're doing? Um, how do we really think about capital differently um, when the starting place is to create positive change in the world um, versus to create return and feel good about it? So you talked about family and community <coughs> as kind of the context within which your mm -hmm. sense of uh, purpose and meaning mm -hmm. comes from. So is it more of a cultural uh, kind of tradition that you, you're tapping into and that you feel you're bringing forward uh, as opposed to philosophical or religious or something like mm. that? Yeah, I mean, I think it is, um, for me, cultural. And I think the reality is we all have a cultural, you know, if, if each of you could close your eyes for a minute and think about your own cultural background and the traditions you know, whether it's going back two generations or six generations or 300 years, um, you know, the relationship between this idea of capital or resources more broadly and how we share them and what they mean and what they can bring um, can, it, every culture has a history of doing things differently from how we do it today um, in a way that has meaning infused in it or has, has community infused in it in a different way. And today it's so separate. Um, and one of the uh, amazing organizations, so we partner with a number of great organizations in different parts of the country, and I um, just want to share something that one of our partners is doing, an organization in the Twin Cities. They're called Nexus Community Partners, um, uh, led by a wonderful man named the name of Rapa Maka. And what they do is they partner, Nexus City Community Partners, they partner with um, the whole diverse range of cultural communities that exists in the Twin Cities. And um, in their community wealth building work, they really are wanting to make sure that people are connecting it back to their own cultures. 
Um, the culture of cooperatives is strong in, you know, in that part of the country, but it's a very white, um, you know, very white activity, this idea of an organized cooperative. And so one of the things that they've done is they have created a, um, they call it the North Star uh, Black Cooperative Fellowship, as I believe the name. And so they've created a, a fellowship experience uh, for uh, specifically for folks from African American communities who have historic f family uh, that traces back to slavery in the United States, um, to really be looking at what the history of um, cooperative economics is in the black community, so that it is something that they they bring their own their own f cultural and historical background to, and that you can think about that across every single cultural community, like we all have that. Great. Yeah. So, Amar, your work <coughs> obviously is in Islamic finance, but before we kind of go there, can you reflect a little bit on the cultural context of the work that, that you see and that you're engaged in and how that kind of informs uh, how you approach uh, your framing around this and then maybe pivot toward the Islamic finance piece? Sure. Uh, <coughs> I went to law school largely on a whim. <laughs> How did that and work out uh, for you? <laughs> I just couldn't get in. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, just um, so you know, there, there were very few people of my uh, religious and ethnic backgrounds uh, in the States who were lawyers, far fewer uh, on Wall Street. That's not to say I started out uh, on Wall Street. Uh, I started uh, working in Indonesia uh, and then later uh, at, a, uh, at a Saudi Arabian office of a uh, major U.S. law firm. And it was there uh, in Indonesia that I was first introduced to this concept of Islamic finance. But it was sort of, sort of a dis uh, you know, I sort of, it was at a distance from me. Um, <clears throat> and a few years uh, after graduating, I decided to uh, join what was then uh, the preeminent U.S. law firm in uh, in the U.S. When it comes to Islamic finance, I thought, uh, well, I've got this personal interest, and you know, maybe I could live a more holistic existence if I could unify these kind of components of myself. Um, <clears throat> so I began working, uh, I began learning, uh, and I began asking questions. And as I asked questions, I kind of wandered, you know, spiritually and intellectually as well, uh, largely focused on the how, if you will, or the what that I was doing, drafting contracts, sort of the technicalities, the particulars, the details, sometimes thinking about uh, you know, the higher objectives, uh, the grander purposes, if you will, and oftentimes not really doing that. And about a decade, I guess it was about a decade later, over lunch in Dubai with a dear friend of mine, um, he introduced me to the concept of climate funds. Uh, and uh, we kind of wondered, would something like that be possible under Islamic commercial principles? And so my eyes were opened to all of these different communities and markets and initiatives that were trying to bring notions of social or environmental responsibility or, and so on and so forth into business and trade and finance. And, uh, you know, I sort of fell in love with that, if you will. And um, <clears throat> I saw quite a bit of parallel with, uh, with, with what, I had, what I knew about the Sharia uh, in terms of the Islamic commercial principles and the ethical guidance. So I started studying the socially responsible initiatives and impact investing uh, more and more. And, and and so when you, when you talk about the traditions uh, that I'm sort of utilizing, I'm, I'm sort of fusing in a sense these two. Um, <clears throat> in the Sharia I found, uh, and I'm not the first to find it, so I'm not gonna lay claim to, to anything of that sort, uh, you know, a rich tradition of inclusive governance at all levels of society, uh, environmental sustainability and consciousness. Uh, Muslim thinkers well over a thousand years ago very much concerned with the impact that production, manufacture, consumption, investment would have on a broad range of stakeholders, uh, so much so that they even lay out sort of a theory of, you know, which stakeholders have which rights and how do they interact with one another and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't until I started studying uh, the socially responsible initiatives and coming to SOCAP for the, for the first time last year that all the technicalities that I had been busy with for years, they started to have some meaning now. Hmm. I was starting to understand uh, some of the purposes behind transparency in business, uh, behind risk sharing, behind uh, participatory transactions and economies, behind the prohibition on interest in lending, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So even though the, these, these were 
give you details, I will sort of, yeah, I see that we are linked now to, you know, higher notions of responsibility. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, I, so I guess it, the quick answer would be, um, I'm looking at medieval and classical Islamic discourse. I'm trying to make it relevant to contemporary context. And I'm doing so with my own, with a lens that's, you know, as an American, I'm using sure. the American cultural context to, to look at that tradition. No, that's great. But why don't we pause there for a sec, because I want to come back to the, the, the Islamic finance piece of that more specifically. But Morgan, do you want to talk a little bit about how you see this question of culture as it's informed kind of your understanding and your, you know, traditions that you're bringing forward in this and just reflect on that a little bit? Sure. I think there's three kind of main cultural paradigms that I operate out of. Um, one, and I think, Allison, where you're saying it's just family, it's like family's everything, right? We're 90% water and then the other 10% is like what gets passed down. Um, my family is from a Jewish background, um, Sephardic and Ashkenazi, so Greek and Russian. Sometimes in the U.S. we'll say, you know, Jews, the other white meat, right? We're a little different um, <laughs> origin and culture perspective. Um, and part of that is a really deep history in social justice, right? So, and, and some of that um, separation of Jews is, is in a really negative way, right? That it was no, um, no blacks or Jews written on the wa water fountains in the South, right? And I think that that also led to a very deep um, history of solidarity, um, not just from like an allyship perspective, but because our lives also depend on it. Um, and it's sort of no accident that Jews were the founders of the NAACP Legal Fund, that they were 90% of the freedom riders, even though we're only 2% of the US population. I'm very proud of that. Um, and I think that some of that has ruptured over the last decades, and that's a whole other story. Um, but I do think in terms of um, whether within my family or even as a, as a cultural, not religious at all uh, Jew, there's something in the water. Um, and I think that there's something in a lot of people's waters. Um, and that it often can be kind of connecting back to what is the family history that we can connect into and, and that can motivate us to want to carry that forward. Um, the other that's kind of funny for me is, you know, Jews uh, historically managed a lot of money because it was viewed as a dirty profession, right? So they gave it to the Jews to do and then, ha ha, we took over the financial system, right? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> right. Um, so there's sort of a, you know, the joke around my family is that I sort of stepped into that stereotype as well. Um, but the other uh, tradition that I was really steeped in and feel really informs my work is just um, traditions and learnings amongst social activists um, and the sort of central notion of nothing about us without us um, and how to think about accountability to affected communities and seeing that as practice, right, as something that you have to do on a daily basis, not just a philosophy but an action. Um, I feel like is a really critical component to my work, and it's part of why I'll often be at venues like the World Social Forum or Facing Race, where I'll have activists literally come up and say, wait, you're an investor? Like, why are you here, right? In a way that sometimes can, can even be a little bit hostile, um, which is fine. Like, there's great reasons for historic distrust of investors, um, but part of it is saying, if we want to really move from a purpose-driven place, how do we kind of stay accountable to social justice values within that? Um, and I think the, the second uh, piece to that is, is also um, about doing actions in collectivity. Um, so I, I recently uh, wrote a book, as some of you know, that came out last week called Real Impact. Um, and one of the fights I kept having with my editor is that I kept saying we at moments when it was kind of more grammatically appropriate to say I, right? And she kept trying to edit out my wheeze and I kept saying, well, but I never did any of this alone, right? Like there were all these other people who were part of this. Um, and that sort of vision of collectivity um, and the importance of acknowledging that in every moment, I feel like is really critical um, in terms of connecting to purpose because it is about that interconnection. Um, and then the final one, unless I'm taking too oh, much please. time, um, is that I do a lot in music and dance, um, and that that has been a, a huge part of my life. Um, I was a, a professional hip-hop dancer from years 15 to 20 before I decided that college was a good idea. Um, I don't, I think that's the first time I've declared that publicly, but <laughs> there it is. Um, and 
part of what's beautiful about the dance community is that um, you have people from so many different backgrounds where you would never ask the question, what do you do, right? There are people I've had really deep relationships with for 20 years um, where that is just kind of irrelevant, right? Because there's so many other ways that we're connecting and learning to be with each other and that it might be people who I've never even spoken to, but I'm able to have this really um, deep connection in a very um, fast way. Um, through the art. So I think that's the other that really informs my work of thinking about what are ways of connecting with people, um, what are different ways of, of assessing worth that's not always just about um, what it is that you know, but how you make people feel. Um, and that that really translates into the way that I try to show up for people um, in terms of purpose. So, so those are three pretty powerful examples of, again, the, the cultural mindset and tradition informing uh, how you approach your work. Flipping it to the other side, are there things professionally as an investor that undermine your sense of kind of meaning and purpose and that you have to kind of fight against? Or are there the inverse of that? Are there things that you are asked to do professionally that actually affirm and advance what you're culturally trying to be about as well? Um, I love, Jed, one of the things that you inspire in people is authenticity. So I'll, I'll give you the first thought that popped into my head, um, which was really about stereotype embodiment. And I don't know if people are familiar with that term. Um, it's one that I, I learned about much after I realized I was doing it, which is that when you start, um, when people perceive you in a certain way, you start acting more that way. Um, and I started, I was a, a first time executive director when I was 23 years old. I was leading the Responsible Endowments Coalition. It's supporting um, college campuses across the country and investing their 400 billion uh, towards social investment. And people presumed that I you know, knew nothing and nothing to add to the conversation. I was a woman. Um, and, and that sort of continued throughout my career. Of, um, I learned I couldn't wear black at certain events because people would ask me to get them water. Um, people assumed I was the secretary, you know, even if it had like managing director on my card. Um, and I think um, those instances where I embodied that stereotype, right, and I would even go further to try to prove myself that I really had my financial chops and I knew what I was talking about, um, even just amplifies uh, that sensation. Um, so I guess I would say that times in my work that I have um, allowed myself to feel small um, by the actions of others um, and that it took me a while to, to get trained out of that. And what was kind of interesting, when I started to get a good amount of gray hair, um, I, I started talking to um, women that were older than me in the field, and I realized I wasn't going to age out of it. And what was really disconcerting, it, it, I was pretty depressed for about a month after, I realized it wasn't ageism, it was sexism. And that I wasn't going to get to age out, right? That I was going to be stuck with this, and therefore, I needed to figure out another way to get past that, essentially. Um, part of that is that I have a male business partner who is unbelievably supportive. Um, so there's some venues where I'll just say, you need to go to this instead of me. I know I'm not going to be comfortable. And he's OK with that. Um, so I think you learn how to self-manage um, in venues that are not always going to be kind to you in whatever body you happen to be born into. Sure. Um, and other ways that you push past it. Hmm. So Umar, I, I know that. Being an attorney is a very inclusive and affirming environment. To work <laughs> in. um, I would, could you reflect a little bit on your experiences and, and how you've worked to try to keep your presence uh, in that? And if there are things within the law that actually are affirming of what you're trying to be about in terms of your practice? Yeah, you know, um, kind of building off of some of what, some sort of echoing what Morgan had said. Do people think you're the secretary too? <laughs> No, that, that, that hasn't happened. There's been other um, You know, I didn't really want to be in Islamic finance. I wanted to be in venture capital. Um, and the, the firm that, uh, that, I, uh, that I, I went to work for, um, you know, they had uh, a very prominent standing in the Middle East. So they kept kind of nudging me over saying, well, you know, you're Arab. I kept saying, I'm not Arab. <laughs> Mm. They, would, they would literally say, but you're close enough. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you're sort of in this position, you don't want to lose your job either and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I find myself where, where I am. Um, <clears throat> so, mm. there, there are things, I think, uh, there, there are certainly challenges. 
you know, we're working in cultural contexts and even in regulatory environments that are designed by uh, a particular ethical outlook, a particular worldview. Uh, maybe it's shareholder profit maximization. Maybe it's uh, you know favorable tax treatment to debt or indebtedness uh, that kind of rub against uh, what I'm trying to do, what my investors, uh, the, the clients that I'm representing, are, are trying to do. Uh, and sometimes, you know, the clients are trying to do things they shouldn't do either. And, and sometimes you're put in, in in a position where you need simply to earn, um, and you have to be careful about. Uh, not taking on work simply for the sake of profit without proper regard to the, the principles uh, that, are, that, are, that are relevant, that are at stake. And, uh, you know, we've, we, uh, we have had to turn down, I say we, my partners and I, have had to turn down some very lucrative assignments, for example, structuring some of the vehicles uh, that led to the recent financial crisis uh, because they know that we can structure, they know that we're, we're creative. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, we, we've, left those at, we've left that at the table and said, no, thank you. We're not going to get involved with that. Um, and, uh, but it's a, it's a continuous process, uh, you know, uh, and trying to, uh, you know, self-transform and, and hopefully that that leads to a transformative sure. uh, business. Yeah. So you're nodding your head, <laughs> but you work in cooperatives. <laughs> That's like God's gift to empowerment and justice and advancing equity in the world. <laughs> Are you resonating in some way? <laughs> well, let's just say that, so back to my business school experience, um, when I tell my business school folks who I haven't seen for a while what I do, and, and they finally kind of wrap their head around it, and they say, they usually say one of two things or both, and they say, a cooperative now, is that a business? Um, or they'll say, co-ops just totally need to be rebranded. <laughs> so, um, you know, the the... There are, across the United States, about 400 worker-owned cooperatives. There are, across the United States, about 8,000 um, employee-owned companies. So if you were to translate that into percentages, you'd be right in a decimal point and a whole lot of zeros, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and so what, w what we're doing, or sort of what we're up against, is a tremendous lack of, of familiarity. People don't know what the heck it is that we're doing. Um, a lot of baggage. Um, if they do think they know what it is, they usually don't actually know what it is. Um, and then where the capital comes into that, we're actually trying to do capital different. Not we, but you know, I didn't create this, but this model of um, democratic employee-owned companies does capital different. Um, and so when you go into when you go to talk to a capital provider who is used to doing capital the normal way and you tell them well i want to um, get a loan for a business that has 27 owners they look at you like you have three heads on right um and on top of that we so we talk a lot about ownership and what ownership means and we actually break it apart so you know you own a company right what are all the benefits of ownership what are the components of ownership well you own it you control it right you own it, you get the profits or are responsible for the losses, right? Um, you own it, you get the benefit of the underlying asset if it appreciates or depreciates. <laughs> um, but in, in a broad-based democratic employee-owned company, what we say is, well, those benefits of ownership shouldn't go to the equity investors. They should actually go to the employee owners. The employee owners control it. Um, the employee owners get the share of profit. And so the capital is participating, but it's not central and it doesn't get the, c the benefits of ownership. Um, and so when we break the, those benefits of ownership down into the component parts, we can think about reassigning them out to the stakeholders, including capital, in a different way, um, partially or wholly. You know, so, so yes, if capital is going to participate, capital gets a return of some sort. Of course, every stakeholder should get a return for participating, but why is it that capital gets the return first in line um, and the people who put their energy and their time and their creativity um, into the business get, the, get it second in line? You know, as we talk about purpose, we talk about purpose of capital, um, there's also purpose of the business itself, right? So, you know, if business is a tool to create positive change in the world, the purpose of the business should be first in line. 
you know, we talk about fiduciary responsibility and that being f first in line. So, you know, the challenge that, that we face is there's a, a system that is out there that has, you know, in many cases sort of unwritten rules that we just all believe, you know, like why is it? Why do we believe that capital should be first in line? Who created that rule? Who agreed to it? Who wrote it down? <laughs> um, you know, in my mind, the purpose should be first in line. The purpose of creating good in the world through business or cap deploying your capital, that should be first in line. Um, and uh, just a really quick story, we're working with a company that is um, decades old, uh, amazing in their, s in their industry, have created for decades amazing impact, have driven their space forward from an impact perspective. And as the owners are getting ready to leave the business, um, and step away from the business, they are saying, you know, gosh, we are afraid that capital is first in line in our business. So when we're no longer here to control it, because we control the purpose by our presence, we're afraid that this company could get acquired um, and the purpose could then disappear. And so they're actually looking at structuring their business in a, um, a perpetual purpose trust so that purpose is first in line. And the purpose includes being successful financially so that we can continue to create the impact in the world. But the purpose does not include maximizing financial return to the capital providers. No, it's, I mean, it's really a great example. And I think that one thing that we tend to forget, we kind of, uh, we take what's given to us as the accepted way of the world and that mm -hmm. somehow the, 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 our understanding with under a financial capitalist approach that the purpose of capital is to make more capital is actually a newer understanding of meaning and purpose of capital and economics. And I think part of, part of what I just kind of like intuitively fell into in terms of my own research and writing was just kind of like a real sense of like, that, that just can't be right, right? <laughs> I mean, there's gotta be this, this, you know, it's not like, you know, the, the purpose of capital was, you know, handed from God to Alan Greenspan's calculator and that's, you know, <laughs> that's it, right? Um, and there's, there's uh, different books, uh, the, the myth of the rational market is one book that's really interesting in exploring kind of like the evolution of modern financial capitalism. And I think we forget that these are all simply social constructs um, that, that we've evolved over time and have roots and traditions and things that have brought them forward in the same way that alternative visions of the purpose of capital are also alive in the world and have roots that go back actually that predate uh, our understanding of financial capitalism by you know, century and century and century. So I think that uh, part of this conversation is trying to, to reconnect and, and root ourselves back in those actually more fundamental and more uh, mm -hmm. uh, principles that have greater primacy uh, relative to what this all is about. And I think you know, religious traditions are clearly kind of like the, the root of a lot of these alternative perspectives about meaning and purpose of wealth. And so I wonder, Amar, if you could, uh, without spending uh, an hour and a half lecturing. Uh, I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about uh, the Quran and talk about uh, the prophet's background and experience and, and how that might have informed the Islamic perspective around the meaning and purpose of wealth and capital. And then maybe do this a little thing on the Sharia and then no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough question to answer. Um, I think I, uh, I think what I would say is that uh, the, the Sharia through the Quran and prophetic teaching uh, lays out uh, general principles and guidelines. And there's some specifics, but there, there are these boundaries. Uh, and and, and uh, I find them pretty broadly drawn, pretty flexible, and there's quite a bit of opportunity for, we'll use the word impact, you might use the word good. Um, <clears throat> and the you know, the, the consideration of the various stakeholders uh, and even capital structure that you were talking about in terms of risk sharing, uh, a lot of that is there and it's built into this, the, the framework. Uh, and so, for example, the Islamic financial institutions and investors, they're embedding their mission into the legal structure of the organization. So the first thing they've done is adopt the modern business entity, and the next thing they've done is say, okay, but it's gonna have a, it's gonna have a particular mission and purpose that limits it, that controls it. Uh, and, and there are, um, there are individuals, uh, we call them sort of euphemistically Sharia advisors uh, that, are, that look at products and transactions and underlying paperwork from an ethical, legal uh, lens, if you will. So, and, and 
there's all, there always has to be a conversation with those folks uh, as to what's happening, why what's being done is being done, and all of that links then to uh, the five purposes of the Sharia, the protection and preservation of life, of religion, of the intellect, of property, and of family. Those are your five purposes. So everything has to fall in line with those and not violate any one of those, uh, uh, any one of those universals. So hopefully that kind of is responsive. But it's to interesting. Your Out of those five principles, I mean, property sounds you know pretty direct toward kind of capital and blah blah blah. The other ones don't have anything to do with with anything having to do with economics necessarily. It sounds. I mean, wh what do you what do you think? Am I did I miss here some of that, Morgan? You're. Uh, <laughs> I gave a body language reaction. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's just interesting, but go ahead. Um, I, I mean, I think what's really beautiful about that, it's a fundamental understanding of everything connects to those five things, right? That sometimes we view economic activity as this other, and that's part of why mm. we'll sort of toss money over to the financial advisor and sort of forget that it's there, or um, the response that I find most hilarious, I know we've all heard the foundations considering impact investment is, um, oh, I'm not sure if it's impactful enough, so I'll just keep my money in Chevron. <laughs> you know. um, so sort of missing the fact that this activity is, is happening no matter what, um, and the impact on the average family when you think about, do I have a quality job that means that I get paid sick days and I have the ability to take a day off and you know, take care of my child or that I'm getting a living wage? Um, how does that impact the family and what does finance do to encourage or um, discourage um, responsible corporate behavior, mm -hmm. I think is, is really fundamental. So let, why don't we turn the, the light on ourselves a little bit. Um, I wonder as you all think about the current state of practice within impact investing, as you think about how we're commoditizing impact in order to create these conforming investment vehicles that can go through these distribution channels and go retail and blah, blah, blah. Is my uh, assumption, or not my premise, that impact investing is basically at risk of uh, becoming disconnected from the deeper meaning and purpose of capital a correct one? Do you see that as well? Or do you think I'm uh, just being uh, a bit of a jerk and kind of overemphasizing things just to sell books? <laughs> <laughs> No to the last part, <laughs> yes to the first part. You um, clearly have seen my book sales. <laughs> no, um. How's that working out for you, Jen? <laughs> but uh, I think that the, uh, there's always a risk of uh, what I'll call, what we can say mission dilution, whether it's for a business uh, or an individual or some other collective. And there has to, there, there has to be uh, periodic reminders uh, of the why of the objective. So if it's a conference, there should be spaces in which there are conversations like this that are happening. And that these conversations are not off to the side, literally and figuratively, they're integrated uh, into all of the conversations, if you will, so that we are reminded of the various rationale, the various whys uh, that may be at play. And, and I appreciate we, there's, there, you know, there's a rich diversity here of purpose and rationale and background and so forth, all of which is relevant. And I say that not so that we learn from one another, but so that we also learn about ourselves from others. Uh, and not merely that we broaden our horizons, but that we have these reminders so that we keep mission or principle or objective or what it, you know, whatever, whatever word it is that we wanna use, that we keep this in mind. Uh, because I think there is that risk there. And, and when we're talking about markets, uh, you know, there are, there are players that step into markets because of certain trends and there's a quantitative advantage to them. Uh, and we've seen this happen. We, we see it in Islamic finance. We've seen it in, I think, organic food, for instance, uh, where players step in and their commitment to mission is, is not there. Uh, their commitment to profit, however, is there. And so there is that risk of dilution. Uh, so we, we need to counter that. Um, in conferences and in spaces like these, but also in our individual lives, where you know we'll we'll see struggles, uh, you know, when it's uh, in different contexts, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we want to sort of stay true, if you will. Yeah, and um, you know what you said about the systems and the the structures, I think that's huge. Is that um, the system? You said the word ethical. <laughs> Like, oh, that's right, ethical should be integrated, right, into these mm -hmm. systems. So the, the question I would have for the impact investing field is how do, how do we ensure that 
ethical is integrated into the systems because the system is going to produce what it's built to produce. So you've got to build it in a way. So if, if impact investing is trying to get into the larger system, does the larger system have ethical built in? And if not, how do you build in ethical? So it's both systems. Um, and then it's also um, just sort of an understanding of, of structures and a sense of, of limitation, I think, that we have of, oh, well, the system works that way, so I have to operate within it. Or the business structure works that way. You know, there's a hunger. We see, why are there so many B Corps, right? There's a hunger for a different kind of a structure to do it differently so that it's got ethical built in, so its purpose is on top, right? Um, and so f I think we have to constantly be questioning, do mm -hmm. the systems and the structures, do they actually serve the purpose? And if not, we've got to rebuild them because otherwise we're, you know, we're going to be stuck with them and then everybody's going to have to operate that way and we're going to assume that the unwritten rules of how those systems work are the rules that we have to live by but they're not the rules that we have to live by. They're not the rules that we have lived by historically in the past. So it, we need to be, we need to, to, to not just allow that to happen. We need to step in and be a part of making sure that it doesn't happen that way. And Morgan, are, are we at risk of becoming untethered from purpose? I think that when we start to really focus on the questions of how, um, in terms of execution, that we've done that really well from a financial perspective and that we've answered a lot of the uh, questions around like, can we scale, can we get market rate, can we do some of these really essential tasks, but can we do it in a way that scales the purpose alongside the impact? That to me feels like the execution gap. So it's connecting to purpose from an execution perspective, right, to get both of those things together. Um, so, for example, in the traditional uh, finance world, less than 3% of fund managers are black or Latino. And I think the average impact investor would likely get up on stage and say that they support racial justice, but then you look at their portfolios and it doesn't necessarily look that different, right? And then it becomes the question of, well, what are the practices that would actually get you from your stated purpose to manifesting that in the world, right? Um, so one of the things that we did recently was finally went through and said, okay, yes, we say we care about racial justice, but what does our portfolio look like? And what we found out is that it looks really awesome. Um, it's about 60% people of color if you exclude the clean tech investments, where we are absolutely over-indexed towards white men. Um, and part of that has to do with the way the clean tech build is structured. Um, but it caused us to think a lot about, well, yes, some of those investments are specifically targeted towards communities of color. So they're doing solar installations in low-income communities in Louisiana, or they're um, retraining former coal workers in West Virginia to become solar installers. Um, but that we might need to do more to think about the ownership or think about the founders and, and diversity from that perspective. So that gives me an action plan of saying, okay, I'm still on my purpose, but I need to drive my purpose a little more when I'm looking at clean tech, right? right like right. what's the specific practices that actually support mm -hmm. your purpose? Right now, when I ask a lot of managers, so what's, how do you learn about what social change is needed of, of how you're manifesting that purpose? And a couple times I've gotten the answer, well, I read the New York Times. Um, I mean, I read the New York Times too, it's a great publication. But the point is, right, if you're trying to make social change, what do you need to do to be much more consistently educated, engaged, and accountable um, to your purpose? And I would posit it takes as much discipline as it does to execute your financial mission, right? It can't just be kind of an add-on to that financial yeah. mission. So the great thing about SOCAP, obviously, is that we're bringing together folks who are first and foremost about changing the world and getting out there and grappling with this in practice. Um, we're going to, you know, in a couple of minutes, kind of pivot over and uh, give an opportunity for you all to just kind of have your own conversations around this topic and then share that uh, back up to the larger group. But before we do, I wanted to see if uh, any folks had any comments or questions, uh, either the panel or any statements you want to make before we go into our kind of deep dive uh, as a group. In the back, please.
can uh, yeah. to start I guess I try to think regardless of sector or geography about the difference between incremental change and systemic change um, and that for every industry that's going to be a little bit different in terms of what a systemic intervention might mean or like what is the next step um, but I think it's always about how do you like push the ball a little bit further each time in that direction as opposed to trying to get it perfect either um, and that part of it is sometimes thinking about any solution is, is kind of just a transition into the next step rather than a dead end. Um, and that going back to what Allison was saying, it's about asking questions. Like, are we asking questions consistently around what systemic change can be and who needs to be at the table to even make that decision? And how do we kind of set that table in a much broader fashion? Um, that I feel like resting in the, um, in the constant inquiry helps me to feel like I'm still on purpose as opposed to feeling like, I have to be perfect and succeed in the absolute, you know, pinnacle of social justice all the time, which is just not attainable. Mm -hmm. a any other thoughts on that point? Um, you know, I would just say, also for you personally, you know, what's your what's your north star? You know, what is that? Like, if I found my north star in I believe that we fundal fundamentally need to change the inner workings of our economy <laughs> um, around ownership and control of capital. So that's my North Star. Um, and so, yeah, what's, what's the North Star for yeah. you? Mm -hmm. I've also heard that described as first principles. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think part of the challenge in this conversation is we're in, we live in a society, and I think we're also kind of morphing in, in the impact investment space to this place where everybody is supposed to have answers all the time. You have like, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking for capital, God forbid, you know, you don't answer the right question from somebody who's got money that you want to have them invest with you. Um, if you're an advisor, you're always supposed to immediately understand the issue and have an opinion and a perspective, and that's the answer kind of thing. And we don't really have a space for simply reflection. Uh, we don't have a, 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 an appreciation of the rhetorical question, but, you know, the, the, the paradox where you can just put something on the table and just kind of be with it and, and let the answer come from silence. <laughs> um, and, and I find it, uh, and as an advisor, <laughs> I'm as bad as this as anybody, but at the same time, I feel like um, there's a lack of humility and a lack of appreciation of the journey and, and the process and really taking time to, if there's you know, 20 kind of purpose statements going deeper and understanding the connectivity between those really and what, what underscores and supports um, that out here. And I think this is exactly what I was saying before where I feel like you know, in our space we kind of, we focus so much on the execution piece that we're starting to drift I think away from uh, some of these deeper kind of uh, understandings that actually could inform execution if we brought them forward. And then the, the, the last thing I would say is that um, we're not the first ones to grapple with these questions. And I think every generation, because we have this very linear understanding of time and progress, we, every generation seems to think that they're the pinnacle of evolution and that you know, they're better looking and wealthier and smarter than the generation before kind of thing. And when you really take time to, to read like 5,000 years of human history, you're like, I mean, I gotta tell you, I, I have never realized how incredibly stupid I am, right? Because you really realize that there's nothing new. These are all the same issues. And in fact, you have traditions, you have um, different philosophical perspectives. You have, I mean, folks have put a lot of energy into trying to understand, like, what is this fundamentally about? And what is it that we're really trying to be about, uh, not only in our individual lives, but in our lives as a community? And, um, and I think we're really, um, we're the poorer for not bringing that forward and injecting it into these conversations. Because when you think about cooperative structures in any number of cultural contexts, this is how people used mm -hmm. to organize, <laughs> if you will. You know, mm -hmm. when you think about uh, you know, the fact that before being called by God, you know, the prophet was a merchant and basically understood kind of like the connection between commerce and community at, at a level that uh, I don't think a lot of folks who haven't really looked at it could appreciate. Uh, and then the same thing in terms of advocacy and empowerment and all of these. These are super strong traditions. And, you know, the very first jointly traded stock company was the Dutch East India Company. 
1604, and when it came back from its expedition, uh, some of the Mennonite stockholders uh, sold their stock in protest because of the piracy practices that the company had engaged in in order to make its profit. So this is, these issues have been with capitalism since day one. Uh, are there any other uh, thoughts or reflections before we turn? Please. No, it's really true. I mean, one of my uh, more amusing kind of facts that I learned in my reading process was that Martin Luther, during the period of the Reformation, he would go from area to area and meet with people to kind of foment a, a different perspective about the church. But he traveled with uh, one priest and three attorneys, <laughs> which I think is just fascinating. <laughs> I mean, so right there, he basically is grappling with how do you, how do you execute and how do you maintain kind of fidelity? Yeah, Other thoughts? Know. I'll know uh, in that same historical vein, you know, Candide Group is named after the Voltaire novel, which admittedly I had never read until my business partner came forward saying, hey, this could be a good name for us. And Candide is all about wrestling with the origins of good and evil. And I feel like that is what we're doing every day, right? We're not coming forward saying we have the answer to it, but we commit to that wrestling. Um, and it also makes me think of the tradition of, and, and this is where you get to see what a bad Jew I am, I think it's Jacob, <laughs> right? And that Yaakov, the name means to be a God wrestler, right? Because he wrestled with the angel all night who then revealed that it was God um, and that the purpose was kind of committing to that struggle. Um, so I, I feel like those pieces of struggle, um, of letting it be kind of a joyous struggle, but that that is the daily work that we do. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Please. Mm. So how, how does that uh, work? Yeah, I'd love to jump in on that. I, I, that, it, that describes 80% of what I do all day, every day. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, for, for uh, so back to the, you know, you go into a, bank, a regular banker and you say, I want to loan to something, it's a business with 50 owners, and they look at you like you have three heads on. Um, so I spend a lot of time educating. You know, people are unfamiliar so if you're unfamiliar with something, of course it's going to be scary and weird and like you don't want to deal with it, right? So educating, building relationships, trust, right? When you have trust with somebody, you're more likely to believe what they have to say, even if it's scary or hard or different. Um, and then helping people take baby steps. Um, so I, yeah, I do a lot of bringing, kind of trying to bring, I'm not at the mainstream yet, but you know, bringing folks who are are closer to where I am, bringing them along closer so that then we can bring the next ones behind along closer. Um, yeah, and I would say it's about relationship, education, and, and trust. How about that? The Please. Uh, I think I, I, would, uh, I would echo uh, what Allison has said. I would, um, I would add to that, <coughs> set the example yourself. Set the example yourself as an individual uh, and uh, 
you know, the, the struggle that we've been talking about, I think it's first and foremost an individual struggle. Uh, I don't think that systems will transform or be transformed unless individuals are also themselves and ourselves transformed. Uh, so I think that that struggle uh, is, is critical and uh, we need to um, demonstrate uh, a self-transparency, a self-assessment process, uh, and then be doing what we're talking about doing, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and add, you know, adding again to, to what she's talked about in terms of relationship building, education, you mentioned humility uh, mm -hmm. earlier on. I think those are, and, and having an open mind and, you know, letting whatever questions or comments come, uh, you know, let them come without, uh, uh, you know, judgment, let alone anger, uh, and just, you know, explanation and, and easing things along gradually. Morgan, how do you keep uh, purpose present as you engage in change? Um, I think I can share some of what I have done, and I don't know if that's a model <laughs> um, or, or right for every situation. I think, um, I think to some degree for me, I found you can't do it all at once, and that one of the things that's nice about when you start to live more years is that you get to go through various phases of life. Um, and that means sometimes getting to be a lover where I want to invite everyone in and, and kind of have that open space and sometimes when I need to be a fighter um, and that there are certain things where you do eventually put your foot down um, and, and also decide not to spend your energy on people who don't, who are just not interested in what you have to say. Um, so I've gone through periods where I worked with 200 investors and now I work with two, right? And part of it was that I came to a point in my career of feeling like, there was very specific work and values that I wanted to follow and I wanted to build that model to show that you could really do it and that I wasn't just spouting out all these you know, radical notions of what you could do with capital, but that I'd actually built portfolios that were doing it, right? Um, and hopefully that that helps in the process of calling in rather than calling out of like, here's this amazing thing that you could be a part of. Um, and then there's other times where um, I, I'm from Oakland, California, which is right next to the Chevron headquarters, which is why I pick on Chevron a lot in talks. But um, I remember some of my uh, early activism in the early 2000s um, was around what was happening in Ecuador and being at the shareholder meeting and an indigenous woman got up to the mic, opened up her shirt in front of the whole board of directors of Chevron to show the incredible rash she had on her body um, from Chevron's refusal to take responsibility for cleaning up the oil spills and talking to their CSR person who's saying, we're so sorry for those poor people, but it's just not our, you know, it's just not our fault. They need to talk to the Ecuadorian government. I don't have patience for that woman. <laughs> I wish her and her karma really well, um, but I hit a point of deciding I wasn't gonna put my energy there, right? That I was gonna put my energy in building the positive alternatives so that people can have control of their land and say no to the oil companies, right? So I think when is it the time to love? When is it the time to fight? And you, sometimes you can't love everybody and just have to be okay with that. Mm. So we were gonna break into like small conversations with folks, but I feel like we're a small enough group and we only have about 10 or 15 more minutes. So is everybody okay if we just kind of continue this conversation of the whole? Is that all right? Uh, Elliot? Can people give their names when they give questions? Sorry. That's Elliot. Part of it. Hi, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I have always felt that business is a tool to create positive good in the world. Um, you know, I'm not going to uh, go into a deep philosophical um, sort of descriptor of that. I, like, I don't know that I necessarily have an answer deeper than that. But, um, you know, I do think it's shameful in this country that we have so much money. And yet we have not figured out how through commerce we can actually take care of everyone in our country. Um, so I see the juxtaposition of, you know, however you want to describe it, the wealth gaps, the income gaps, um, the incredibly shameful racial wealth disparities we have in this country. Um, so you know, the purpose of business should be to make sure that 
we, we are taking care of each other, like plain and simple, um, including taking care of the planet, you know, the, in the broader purpose. But um, that's how I feel about it. Mm. Uh, I think at a, at a sort of a basic level, uh, we engage in business and trade uh, to earn money. Uh, and Islam does not, uh, uh, when I, uh, let, me, let me rephrase, let me rephrase. Islam encourages earning profit, but it's done inside a certain framework. Uh, and the ultimate purpose is benefit and prevention of harm uh, <laughs> and echoing uh, both the beauty as well as the magnanimity of the divine. Uh, so business, while, while, while we engage in business uh, to earn a profit, uh, it's to fulfill responsibilities. Right. In and of itself, the, the profit or the capital, uh, I would say it's useless. Uh, but if it's fulfilling responsibilities that one may have towards one's dependents, loved ones, uh, one's neighbors, so on and so forth, now you begin uh, to, to speak about business uh, in a more complete sense. Um, I really appreciate one of the pieces of writings from Paul Hawkins that talks about how commerce is this really ancient practice, right, which is just the exchange of goods to make sure people get what they need. Um, and I think about that from the perspective of when the revolution comes, I don't want to make my own shoes, right? Like there's, there's things that it, it, trade can be really positive for um, in terms of getting the things that we need. And if we're able to focus more on that element of commerce than the capital accumulation, a uh, piece of it, or capital accumulation to the extent to which it enables us to make things that are useful to people, um, then that to some degree takes the ownership piece even out of the question altogether, um, because then it's just about commerce being activity that gets people what they need, um, as opposed to business being its kind of own purpose, I think is what happens, that it gets really divorced from the idea of taking care of human needs. That's great. Other thoughts, please. So it's kind of a, a higder order understanding of the license to operate kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, Other thoughts, good. please. So how did you all uh, wait? I'm sorry? Oh, okay, well, I'll go last. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll go last, but please. Um, you know, I feel like I've been pretty lucky in that, um, back to the North Star, like my North Star has been 